hit me. From Studio P in Sausalito, the home of the hit, it's time for... Suckatash. Yes, Suckatash, the comedy soundcast soundcast featuring snippets from comedy... Soundcasts. And also interviews with comedians, comedian soundcasters, and other showbiz folk. And now, here's your host, internationally recognized comedy soundcast soundcaster, Mark... Welcome, welcome, welcome. Whether you've downloaded this soundcast or are streaming it from somewhere on the World Wide Web, as host of Suckatash, the comedy soundcast soundcast, I am delighted that you're listening. Apologies for not knowing your name, but I'm Mark Hershon, the host, executive producer, and founder of this little slice of Soundcastville, which kicked off just two weeks shy of 11 years ago. Before I get into what's in store for you in the next half hour or so, let me ask if you had a chance to lay ears on last week's Epi 296, entitled A More or Less Typical Episode, hosted by my fastidious and factually accurate co-host Tyson Saner. He featured clips from a triad of soundcasts, including Judy Cast with Francis Gum, The Ramble, and Lightning Bugs, Conversations with Ben Folds. The good news for you, if you happen to miss it, is that you can still grab it on Apple or Google Podcasts, Stitcher, SoundCloud, YouTube, Amazon Music, Audible.com, as well as any number of reputable distribution nodes across the web, including our own SuckatashShow.com. Since you're here now, however, I'll let you know that I'm going to be shaving off shreds of three soundcasts, Citation Needed, The Stoners Next Door, and War and Peace in Just Seven Years. I've also got another slice from comedian Dan St. Paul's blog and a trailer from a brand new soundcast that's dropping this week entitled Rituals. And even though we're still shaking the bushes for a real sponsor, I have a commercial from our long-running fake sponsor, Henderson's Pants, and their just-now-in-season picnic pants. Before I get into the clips, just a quick bit of news for longtime listeners of this cast that remember our feature, The Burst O' Durst, with San Francisco comedian and social commentator Will Durst. Will suffered a stroke back in fall of 2019 and has been on a very long and slow road of recovery all the way through the pandemic. He's still working hard to get it all together, but I was delighted to find he's finally started posting on Facebook in the last couple of weeks. You can dig the Durst at facebook.com slash will.durst.9 and let him know that we're waiting with bated breath for him to start pumping out the funny again. All right, let's get into today's clips. The first comedy soundcast I'm clipping today is a five-hander. That is, five hosts who stir the stew that is citation needed. Weirdly, in the About Us section of their home site, some of the guys have last names and some just don't. There is Cecil, Eli Bosnick, Heath, Noah Lujans, and Tom. The format for this show is hilariously simple. They pick a subject, read one article about it on Wikipedia, then (laughs) pretend to be experts on that topic. The focus for their episode that dropped just last week was Alice Roosevelt, the eldest daughter of U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt. She was pretty much crazy pants Looney Tunes and a deliciously black sheep of the family, and her dad Teddy R. was a bit of a dick about it. Just listen as the guys take their initial dip into the Alice Roosevelt pool. Let's go ask Alice. I think she'll know. (laughs) So tell us, Tom, (laughs) who was Alice Roosevelt? All right. For our live show in New York, I did an essay on FDR, and I've had it in my head to follow up and do an essay on Teddy Roosevelt at some point as well. And I was headed there this week when purely by accident, my wife stumbled upon and pointed me to the life of Teddy's daughter, Alice Roosevelt. And the more I read about Alice, the more I realized that here is a character in every sense of the word that was so much larger than life that she nearly eclipsed the equally mammoth personality of her notoriously celebrated father. Alice Roosevelt is one of those characters who seems to be constantly in possession of just enough rope to hang herself and who manages still to wiggle free from real responsibility. She was a presidential wild child and a just marvelously poorly behaved human being, and I admire the unmitigated temerity of her. 
It would be easy to dismiss Alice as perhaps a bit of a brat, but this is a woman whose hijinks influenced and swayed major elections in American politics. For all her faults and foibles, the sheer audacity with which she lived her life is at the very least fascinating. All right. Nobody tell Tom about Paris Hilton. (laughs) it's it's too late for me to say nobody tell eli that sometimes sheer audacity is enough so sure at least that (laughs) okay okay no hold on hold on hold on how come Noah or i give a tiny little bit of backstory and everybody's like so boo boo but tom (laughs) selects a topic like he's a food blogger blowing off the dust off grandma's fucking (laughs) recipe card box and then he spends a chapter telling us why he picked nana's waffle pie and how it tastes like sunshine and growing up among the maples in vermont and no one's that's a goddamn thing, man. <laughs> Blue Tom. Because I say it with poetry, Cecil, with poetry. Asshole. Alice Lee Roosevelt <laughs> was born a really good intro, on Tom. February 12th, 1884, just two Not days to Keith anymore. before the absolute bleakest <laughs> moment in her father, Theodore Roosevelt's life. Tell Cecil I don't care. <laughs> Just two days after giving birth to her daughter, Alice's mother, also named Alice, took suddenly ill and died of an undiagnosed kidney failure. Just 11 hours earlier that day, Teddy's mother would die in the same house of typhoid fever. Theodore Roosevelt's (laughs) journal chronicles his despair with a page marking the day with a large, simple X. And the single sentence, quote, the light has gone out of my life, end quote. Young Alice's life was not off to a particularly smooth start. <laughs> Jesus fuck. Well, I mean, but it's 1884, right? Like, so she's alive. It's, I would say it was neutral, right? By the standards of the top. Medium. <laughs> Alice's father, Teddy Roosevelt, was so utterly crushed by the loss of his wife, Alice, that he never again spoke of her and would not allow for her to be named in his presence and omitted her from his autobiography. Cool, healthy, good, awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Baby Alice was referred to as Baby Lee, a moniker she retained as she got older, frequently going by Mrs. L rather than Alice. Theodore, now bereft of wife and mother and with a two-day-old daughter, was far too distraught for playing the role of a single father in 1884. Instead, he left baby Alice with his sister, Anna, and he fucked off to his ranch out in North Dakota. Tom, I I know that the bereaved husband has a certain panache to it, but have you considered that Teddy Roosevelt was a bad dad who sucked? Yeah, I have. I have 100%, and I agree with that. Okay, but national parks... He invented that. He invented <laughs> teddy bears. Teddy, Land teddy bears man. that we have. <laughs> yeah, he's a shitty dad. He's a <laughs> shitty dad. He's a one hundred percent. That's correct. This is to be not a good dad. Yeah, that. is a, not a good dad. That's a taste of citation needed, and there's a rich pageant of archives for their show on their home site. We have it linked at our home site, SuccotashShow.com, and you can catch their episodes pretty much everywhere soundcasts are to be found. This next show claws out a special little niche for a comedy soundcast, that in the area of literature. War and Peace in Just Seven Years is attempting to provide the equivalent of one of those episode-by-episode watch-along TV show soundcasts like Office Ladies or Fake Doctors Real Friends, except they're doing it with the 1,225-page epic tome War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy. With 500 characters, there is no lack of material in store. The hosts, Will and Steve, are both British comedians, but they conveniently have not used their last names on the show's home site. A recent episode picks up the action in 1886 or 1887, and things are looking a bit grim for the world at large. Listen, you've just read some of War and Peace book five. Well done. Please tell us all what you've just learned. I absolutely will, uh, Will. (laughs) Okay, <laughs> I'm amazed you've never had to say why, it like why, that. Why before? that never happened before? That's I like the strange. way you paused. Uh, it really threw me. But it anyway, really did. You do, you do this to me quite a lot, so mm. I'm going to do it to you now. It does give me pleasure to ask you, Will. What is the exact date? <laughs> <laughs> it's so tough. Oh, we did talk about it a bit. It's either 1806 or may- maybe it's 1807. Now it's always March. It's a good guess. I'm going to say. March 1807. Okay, so 
you were right about the year. Okay, good. But I was looking for I was looking for even more specifics on the on the on the month. Oh wow! It's June. Wow! It's June eighteen oh seven. Wowzers! And um, what happens in June? Well, of course, we get a few bank holidays here in the UK, don't we? Yeah, we do. Yeah, and, and just this is this is an aside. It must be. <laughs> this is an aside. It absolutely. But this must year, be. this year, yes, we get an extra bank holiday in the UK. We do. Um, to celebrate the the Queen's Platinum Jubilee because she's so old. Not old. No. She's been, well, yeah, she, no, it is partially to do that. It runs along the same thing. She, she's been the queen for 70 years. So long. Well done. Um, it's amazing. Well and done. I'm not saying there's a strong link to can't be. War and Peace there. There can't be. Other than the fact that, strangely, Nikki also has a holiday in June. <laughs> you really linked that up well. <laughs> I'm impressed. It's not because the queen's been there for a long time. Um, no, it's got nothing to do with... No. with with the future. No. So the reason Nicky has got his holiday is because the Battle of Friedland has, has just been fought. Okay. And uh, after that battle, we don't know any details, but there was a small armistice declared all right. after the battle. Does that mean you all just give up for a bit? Uh, it seems to mean that the, the military people can sort of just go, <laughs> go, go, on go, holiday. go away for a bit. <laughs> we'll take that answer as a we're both not sure. Yeah, we're both not particularly sure, but but certainly Nikki is allowed a bit of time away from the front lines. Go on holiday, mate. So, well, if you had a, a small armistice to enjoy mm. um, after spending months and months living in a in a mud hut, yeah. eating poison potatoes, just eating poison. Um, wh- where would you go? What would you do? Oh, where would I go? What would I do? I would certainly leave Russia. It's just straight away. <laughs> I'm okay. done. And yeah. it's it's unlikely I'm going back as well. Well, you're in Prussia at the moment. So Am you, I? That's tick, box ticks already, oh, really. Right. Sweet. Get on a horse, get myself to, I guess I'm going to Disneyland in France. Yes, right. Yeah, I yeah. think I'd go there. You'd go to Disneyland Paris. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, would take, it would take a while. Days and days. Probably, probably I'd weeks. load up a Darren 4, Darren 5 maybe, and we'd go straight there. Fantastic. Boom. Darren and I will be greeted by Visa card for our special cocktail celebration with Mickey or whatever the hell <laughs> He'll goes bring a, on. He'll bring a tear to the eye, it really will. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, we've learned a little bit about you there. Maybe it's fair to say you're quite self-involved. Yes, I think so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, because Nicky, it seems, is, is, is kind of a nicer guy Oh, is he going to go home? Nicky took advantage of the armistice to get leave to visit Denisov in hospital. Oh, yeah, Denisov got shot, Denisov he? got shot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, sort of to try and avoid... Possibly the the court martial that he's undergoing for stealing all the biscuits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just just to clarify as well, I don't care about Denisov, so it's fine for me to sure. go to Disneyland. Sure, don't, sure. Don't okay. smirk me. That's nice. That's yeah. nice the way you said that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Denisov is in hospital in a small Prussian town, um, which is surrounded by beautiful summer fields. Oh, sounds June great. After all. Yeah, yeah. And actually, you know what? Close your eyes if you would, Will. We haven't done this in a while. We haven't. We haven't. All right. Close your eyes, if you will. Yes, I have. You at home, listeners, you can close your eyes as well. You don't have to do what he says. <laughs> <laughs> close your eyes. It's, yes, it's a small It's a small town. Yeah. Maybe it's a village even. Yeah, maybe. Uh, the fields, beautiful. Oh, yeah. Summer, June. Oh, it's great. Oh, butterfly. Oh, hello, maybe. mate. Maybe. Smells nice. Lovely Does. smells. Mm-hmm. Village smells. Mm-hmm. Oh, a drunken soldier. Hello. Lovely. Lovely. Oh, look how nice. The roofs and fences are all, all broken. <laughs> <laughs> lovely lovely and the inhabitants yeah, oh, of the yeah, village yeah. so tattered and sickly oh okay wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Okay. and the streets yep. just picture picture it oh right I am but I don't want to they're foul oh okay completely foul wonderful stuff yes yeah, so you, you can open your eyes wow what a lovely place <laughs> yeah unfortunately the town has quote twice been devastated by Russian and French troops ugh Leaving it with a quote particularly dismal appearance. Particularly bad smell. So the real question is, will the hosts of War and Peace in just seven years manage to get all the way through that book in two thousand five hundred and fifty five days? That's seven years? Listen and find out. Also listen to this coming up. It's a message from our sponsor. Henderson's Pants. Hello, friend. Summer may be winding down, but with plenty of warm weather still ahead, now is the perfect time to take advantage of Henderson's annual sale on picnic pants. You know, you shouldn't wear white after Labor Day, but don't let that old saw stop you from slipping into a pair of white and red checked Henderson's picnic pants. Roomy, cool, and comfortable, Henderson's Picnic Pants are a walk in the park. And once you've found that perfect spot to plop down your basket, that's when your picnic pants go into action. 
One firm tug achieves easy release and the pants legs unfurl to form a ground cover wide enough to accommodate the entire family. Specially built pockets hold an entire arsenal of sporks, while the insulated pockets, both front and rear, keep plenty of coleslaw, potato salad, and condiments on ice until you're ready to eat. I know what you're thinking, what about my meat? Well, friends, with Henderson's patented concealed crotch cooler, there is plenty of space to tuck away those weenies, brats, and patties until the coals are hot enough to stick them on the grill. And with our buttocks basket, you'll be sure to have an ample supply of buns on hand. In addition to being both stain and water resistant, picnic pants are insect repellent too, which means there'll be no ants in your pants when it comes time to bid adios to your favorite park or beach luncheon spot. Originally designed for SEAL Team 6, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and the Donner Party, Henderson's picnic pants are now available on sale wherever fine tarpaulins and mulch are sold. That's Henderson's, makers of fine trousers and pantaloons since 756 A.D. And now, back to Succotash. I got word last week from Lisa Michelli at Metro Public Relations about a new soundcast dropping this week entitled Rituals. It's being hosted by M. Schulz and Christine Schaefer, who've been hosting And That's Why We Drink a very popular paranormal and true crime show that I've reviewed for Vulture.com before, although we have never featured it here on Succotash yet. The description for the new show says that hosts Christine and M will, quote, take listeners through a tour of the dark arts. For fans of Harry Potter and Full Metal Alchemist, they'll dig into the mysterious life of alchemist Nicholas Flamel. Or maybe it's Flamel, who is rumored to have created a real philosopher's stone that could turn metal into gold and grant immortality. This show will be the ultimate occult variety show, evaluating historical and contemporary stories involving witchcraft, sorcery, alchemy, Satanism, spiritualism, and more. Unquote. They didn't provide us with a clip, but here's the prepackaged canned teaser for the show. Christine, are you ready for our new spiritualism happy hour? I have never been more ready, Em. Welcome to our new podcast, Rituals. I'm Em Schultz. And I'm Christine Schiefer. You may know us from the podcast, and that's why we drink. On our new podcast, Rituals, we're exploring the evolution of spiritualism and the occult through stories, practices, and the impact on modern culture. It's a weekly variety show that features tales of witchcraft, seances, werewolves, the fountain of youth, love potions, and even Sylvia Plath. We're definitely going beyond the realms of science and the boundaries of religion to revel in mystical and magical phenomena. Oh, and it's possible we'll have a drink while we do this show, too. Or at least I will. Let's just say if it makes you think beyond your human self, we're talking about it. Practitioners and skeptics, welcome. Rituals premieres Monday, March 21st. You can find all the episodes for free exclusively on Spotify. Rituals is a Spotify original from Parcast. So Rituals dropped yesterday or Monday of this week, if you're hearing the show later on, and is, as you heard in the trailer, a Spotify exclusive. That seems to me that you can't find it anywhere else, which is a damn shame because we at Succotash, we're currently boycotting that streaming service. So because of the whole Joe Rogan controversy. So if you want to cross our digital picket line, go right ahead. But be warned that our booth assistant, Kenny Durgis, may pound the crap out of you. Virtually speaking, I can't imagine that this next soundcast is the only one to dip into the crazy world of Next Door, the half gossip, half neighborhood news site. But the Stoners Next Door does a great job of harvesting some of the loopier posts and their responses from the site. Host Aaron and Maul. Again, no last names on these soundcasts. I don't I don't understand why are they embarrassed that they're doing them? It just doesn't seem like good PR. I think these two are married, but again. Not sure. Anyway, Aaron and Maul don't focus on where the incidents and altercations are happening, which always makes it feel like it's happening in your neighborhood. Our clip is from this past December, their season three finale, and involves a warning from an angry apple tree owner warning neighbors to keep their mitts off his fruit. And then uh, (laughs) this one, this is a follow up on the woman who had the squash. Oh, the stolen stolen squash? Okay. From her front yard. Uh Uh-oh. And I actually admitted to this too. Stop helping yourself to my apple tree. Consider it a legal warning. It is trespassing. You're on a camera. The cameras are very well hidden. No one has permission. Someone or multiple individuals took buckets last night. 
These apples are to be sold to a local parrot store, which is a loss of income for our family, which they are too soon to come, which they are too soon come to pick up. And it was reserved in the spring. Oh my goodness. Um, tomorrow the tree will be gated with signs with a motion sprinkler with blue food dye. <laughs> I like that. Steal at your own risk, looking like a smurfer. <laughs> you don't go to a store and help yourself. That's not yes, true. Yes, they do. That's not yeah, true. Do grapes. You have to sample grapes. I mean, yeah. that's just the golden rule. Yeah. A fruit tree is someone's property. It's for private use, not public. I don't think that's debatable. If it's hanging over the sidewalk, it's fair game. Um, This is the last year it will be in the front. Year after year, we deal with this. It will cost us money to have it professionally moved to the property. Apparently, people do not respect the laws of others' property. But I wanted to do hood rat stuff for my friend. Okay, that's yeah, good. So here are, some, here are some of the responses. I was, to, I was today's years old when I learned there were parrot stores. I thought the same thing, David. I'm like an entire store for parrots. Interesting. <laughs> that, would be, that would be like my hell, to be honest with you. Um, John, John says, and now I need to know from the original poster if there were any blue thieves sighted in the area for sure. Um, are you listening, Ring Company? Now we need our dark cameras to also spray blueprint. <laughs> 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 oh, good. Would that's love so, that. would that not I would be love the that. best? Like, would you could it, just, it, well, like yeah, die just packs. Little, you need die packs. That's just what, a little squirt. My sister and I were talking about, yeah. like, porch pirates and putting die packs, like the banks used to use in their, in their uh, you know, for <laughs> robbers. Like, and not then, authorized. It, right. It just, you just right. You walk them. past the sensors sure. and then they just explode and you're red for about three months. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no denying. I think that was a perfect idea. It's and Ring, right. you should get on this. Yeah. <laughs> join, join. That's be, be an adapter, not an adopter. Yeah. Okay. Kelly says, I do have an, I do an, um, as I do an immediate Amazon search for motion sprinkler with food dice. <laughs> That's funny. So they have cameras, but they don't know whether it was one person or multiple that stole their apples. Oh gosh. And then Mercedes <laughs> also, if you could have a motion detector that sprays a liquid at any offending trasper, trespasser, why blue dye? Why not O oh, yellow P? <laughs> That's our girl. <laughs> oh, God. One of the things I like about the stoners next door is that the episodes are only about 10 minutes long, so you can grab a tasty bite when you have just a few minutes to listen. Their new season kicks off this week, so be sure to track them down. That's the stoners next door. We have a link to their home site, which is conveniently enough, the stoners next door dot libsyn l-i-b-s-y-n dot com same service that carries succotash show just a coincidence or is it on the blog entry for this episode on our home site succotash dot com you can find a link to them and their show and blah 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 when i was last in this feed for epi 295 i featured a new segment called slices from comedian dan st paul's blog of the same name i have another slice of slices for you This one about Dan's trek to a recent Golden State Warriors game with a mutual comedian friend of ours, Bob Sarlat. Give a listen. I bowed out of my monthly high school buddy Zoom chat last night. I knew they'd understand. One of my longtime comedian friends, Bob Sarlat, nicknamed the genius, asked if I would accompany him to a Golden State Warriors game, and I leapt at the chance, who says white men can't jump. For the last couple of months, I'd been sporadically checking out ticket availability for individual games, and the price was always prohibitive for a decent seat, so I basically consigned myself to the couch. But then Bob called, and I know Bob and he wouldn't be caught dead slumming it, so these had to be good seats. I felt like Charlie, who'd just discovered his golden ticket to the chocolate factory. My only responsibility was to pick him up and buy the beer. Being a native San Franciscan, I pride myself on finding free street parking. I knew the genius would be impressed. If someone claims to be from here, you give him 10 minutes to find a parking spot in a busy neighborhood. If they fail, then they're a liar. I nab a spot just a few blocks away from Chase Center. 
San Francisco's new $1.4 billion state-of-the-art multi-purpose arena and home of your and my Golden State Warriors. Shielded from the street surrounding the Chase Center is a circular plaza dubbed Thrive City. It's a gathering space created by the Warriors and Kaiser Permanente to promote health and wellness in the greater Bay Area. Now, all I know is that I've been magically transported to sports fan Nirvana because in front of the arena resides three stories of high, super quality digital screen. It's 74 feet wide and it's filled with nothing but basketball. It bathes the enchanted fans in multicolor light as they gleefully glide toward the turnstiles. And I feel as light as a feather. Once inside, we breeze past the concessions to the top step of our section. And dumbstruck, I just stop and I take in this grand, glistening cathedral. A gargantuan scoreboard hangs suspended over center court two stories of ultra high def displaying not just the score but up to the second game stats of the players currently on the court and the game itself in real time in all four directions you can watch the game you're watching and get these replays i i remark out loud i go this is nuts we sit 17 rows behind the western basket I compliment my host on his seat selection, and he reveals that he went in on season tickets with three other guys. Let's just say a single admission to one game could score you a year's worth of Disney Plus, plus Hulu, plus ENPN Plus. And that's a spit in the ocean compared to a luxury suite, which goes for a cool two mil a season. Mind you, you're not buying something for two million, you're just renting it. We settle into our seats and cheer as the hapless Detroit Pistons are fed to our shorthanded heroes who lead by 20 for most of the game. At halftime, we go up on the concourse and we're looking for, well, I don't know, just something to eat. And we come across these burger dogs, which are exactly what they sound like, elongated ground beef in a hot dog bun and two beers. And for all those four items, a measly $58, payable only by credit card, no cash allowed. It slows things down and all that currency could contain the virus, right? Bob checks his phone and notices there are several calls from his Warriors ticket rep during the game. He calls him back and abruptly, he orders me to follow him. We descend all the way down to just behind the basket and meet his rep at the baseline. He points out our new seats for the rest of the game. Now we're six rows from the court in the club, quote unquote, section. Bob nudges me, not bad, huh? Bob loves having juice. The rep is a young, shifty-eyed hustler in a sluggo cap, always on his phone. He reminds me of the teenage scalper, Damone, from Fast Times at Richmond High. Remember, the crumb who knocks up Jennifer Jason Lee and then won't even give her a ride to the abortion clinic? He's probably a very good fellow, but he just gives off this vibe like he's always on the make. He leads us to the tunnel and hands us off to the guardians of, quote, the club, unquote. We approach a large curtain manned by burly attendants who apply red wristbands to our wrists, and then they open the curtain to reveal the most heavenly sports bar on earth. Two to three hundred hobnobbing lucky stiffs are indulging in a raucous bacchanal of free food and drink. Every table and every wall is adorned with monitors displaying a live feed of the game. Thick, beefy burgers, meaty wings, volcanic nachos, and oven-fired gourmet pizza is there for the taking. Everything that costs an arm and a leg upstairs is free. Top shelf call drinks mixed by professional bartenders waiting for your order. Rows of 20 ounce craft IPAs beckon while I careen about with my cardboard tray of 
beer and burger dogs from the poor side of town. I looked like a goof who walks into the Sunday brunch at the Ritz-Carlton clinging to a sack lunch. Bob and I find a tiny ledge to sit down and devour our beggar's banquet. He apologizes for not checking his phone earlier. He promises to take me to a future game and do his best to get us back into the club and make up for the decadence we so decidedly deserve. The dubs take the game by 16, covering by a half a point. I don't know how they know either. As we empty out onto the plaza, we walk toward a glass-walled studio. Fans are watching the live post-game show with Golden State great Chris Mullen. We leave Warrior Wonderland and wander back to our car, and I drop off the genius and head home reflecting on the evening. I was dazzled. It was almost as exciting as the 1975 NBA Finals game I attended versus the Washington Bullets. I'm still trying to figure out how I was only 23 and somehow could afford a seat back then. I must have emptied my savings account. So yeah, the Chase Center. Maybe the ninth wonder of the world. But it still ain't no Cow Palace. Dan St. Paul and I are still trying to figure out if people are enjoying these audio odysseys, so please drop me an email at marc at succotashshow.com or drop a note in your socials directed to us at Succotash Show to let us know if you're digging these stories. We're considering a short-term soundcast of Dan's very own featuring stories just like this, and I'd love to hear if you're enjoying them so we can figure out what are, whether to ramp up the soundcast machine and crank out another episode uh, just about them. That's about all the time we have for clips and such this week. I just want to yank open the tweet sack real quick to thank a few folks for mentioning at Succotash Show in their socials in the past week or so. Abner Surd. Abner Surd? We used to clip some great stuff off his show, but he kind of went dark for a while, so glad to see he's out there. Hi, Ab. Kirsten Chambers. Max Monday. Travis Clark. Eddie Pence. Misfit Scully, the Jock Doc Podcast, Kevin H. Waite Coachman, Aminas Franco. I shake my head with Lisa and Sam. Hey guys, thanks for mentioning us every week in your soundcasts to listen to. We appreciate it. Becca James, hope you're doing well down there in Miami or Florida. I don't know if you're in Miami. I know you're in Florida. Haven't seen it. That's a soundcast spelled haven't seen it. S-C-E-N-E. IT. Augustin Fuentes, Dad and Confused, Cordelia 77, PJC 76, Jerry Rocha, Hunter Block, Combat Radio, Andy Abramson, DAPF Pod Annalise, Salty Language Podcast, Married Crazy in Podcasting, Latifat Bakula, Matt Knudsen, The Extra Mundane, Olu Segun, Revista Iconima, Who's listening to us? This is fantastic. Andres G's, Soul Hikers, Fascination Street, Loopy Goopy, Guitar Sun Cat, and I Am What I Am. Oh, Popeye's listening. That's great. If you want to be tossed into the tweet sack for a mention in this space, just throw our handle, at Succotash Show, into your socials. If we see it, we'll say it. That's going to do it for this installment of Succotash. As always, it's a pleasure to go out into the Soundcastiverse and scrabble up these tidbits from the incredible range of comedy soundcasts that are out there. Between Tyson and I, it's hard to even pretend to be keeping up with the massive influx of new programs that seem to be dropping weekly. So if we haven't harvested a clip from your show, or a show that you enjoy listening to, you can upload a 3-5 to five minute MP3 clip directly to us at Hightail.com slash lowercase u slash succotash, and we will plop it into an upcoming episode. Speaking of Tyson, he'll be here next week with Succotash episode 298 in a trio of comedy soundcast clips, so don't miss out. Then I will be back the week after that with episode 299. And then for episode 300, 300, we'll also be celebrating our 11th year of doing this ding dang show. I'm going to talk with Tyson about us actually co-hosting that one, and maybe we'll do something special. Who knows? If you want to record a special 300th episode, 11th year anniversary message to us, you can call the Succotash and Runaway Truck Hotline at 1-818-921-7212 or upload a message to the Hightail URL. 
or just say it to yourself while listening to that episode, what, whatever gets it done for you. Just remember that the next time you're running down a perp that skipped bail and it's up to you as a bounty hunter to bring him or her back to justice and someone asks if you're listening to anything fun, won't you please pass the succotash? You've been listening to Succotash, the comedy soundcast soundcast with your host, Mark Hershaw. Brought to you by Henderson's Pants and... Imagine your company's name right here. Rate us and review us at Apple and Google Podcasts. Find us on the web at SuccotashShow.com. On Stitcher. On iHeartRadio. On YouTube. On SoundCloud. And wherever fine soundcasts are streamed and or downloaded. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Suckatash Show. Like us on Facebook. Email us at marc at SuckatashShow.com. Or call into the Suckatash Skype line at our toll call number, 818-921-7212. You can also upload clips from your favorite comedy soundcasts directly to us using our direct upload link at Hightail.com slash you slash Suckatash. Suckatash is produced and engineered by Joe Paulino through the auspices of Studio P. Sausalito, the home of the hit. Our hosts are Mark Hershon and Tyson Sainer. Our musical director is Scott Carvey. Our booth assistant is Kenny Gurgis. Suckatash is executive produced by Mark Hershon. Until next time, I'm your loyal booth announcer, Bill Haywatt, reminding you to please pass the Suckatash. Goodbye. This has been a Succotash Patch production.